everyone, and welcome to Golf's Next Gen, the official podcast of the American Junior Golf Association. My name is Tim Jackman. That is Thomas Harrison. Back over there, currently on his phone, actually, is producer Justin. So um, another episode of the AJJ's official podcast. Got some a great guest today, actually, um, when you talk about people raising money and giving back and impacting others. This this kid is really on top of that. So, But first, a couple of things, obviously, we wanted to talk about, a couple of things bring to the table. Did you want to start with what you had, Thomas, and then I'll, I'll talk about what I got. Yeah, so um, we kind of touched on it on the last episode with Yana where not everyone is going to have the best first start out on the AJGA. It kind of got me thinking, you know, let's do a deep dive into some of those people who had prolific AJGA careers, who are great professionals, um, because the conversation I feel like a lot of times if I'm at a preview event or a junior all-star, sometimes the parents will approach me and just ask, you know, maybe their kid's not playing so well. And they're like, I don't know if they're ready maybe we bit off a little bit more than we could chew because they're not having a great round. They're towards the bottom of the leaderboard. And um, usually the conversation I always have with them is, you know, it's not always true. Everyone has a bad start. It's it's not the end of the world if you come out here and have one bad start. It's not time to hit the reset button. That's just the game of golf. That's Anyone can come out and have a bad round. So um, I did a little deep dive into some of our former players. And, Tim, I'm going to rattle off some uh, finishes here, and I want you to try to guess the professional. Um, that rattled these off. Just so, random professionals. Well, I'll give you PGA or LPGA. <laughs> oh, but, thank you. You so know, helpful. really narrow it down. But I'll give you a year. So we have 2005, first season with the AJGA. This PGA professional finished in their first three starts: T79, T65, T65. Brian Harmon. That is Patrick Cantley. Oh, oh geez. So, again, a guy who's had a great career. He has gone on to be incredibly successful, still playing at a high level. He finished tied for last place in his first start. Shot 92-99. He barely broke the century mark. <laughs> is this in a preview event or is it in a – This was an open. Oh. This was an open event. He came in and bottom of the leaderboard. There. That's pretty high even for just any AJG event, 92-99. Exactly. And so that's what I'm saying. You – People are coming out, you know, you shoot 82 in the first round. They think, oh, bad day. Maybe we weren't we weren't ready for this. It's not the end of the world. You can have a bad day. You can come back. Uh, another interesting one for you, 2008, another PGA professional. T40, T41, and T21. Made the debut at a junior all-star in Lubbock, if that helps you at all. 2008, you said? This might that might be early, but is that Scotty Scheffler? That is in fact Scotty yeah. Scheffler. <laughs> so the guy who seemingly can't lose anything on the planet right now was finishing T forty. So if you think about our boys' fields, that's definitely in the bottom quarter here. Yeah, there's not much behind it's you at that 10 point. Almost. And think about that junior all star bottom of the field, and now look at him. So it's just interesting to look at because I feel like people take one start so seriously and take that to heart as far as, you know, oh, maybe maybe this isn't it. It's not the end of the world. Give it a couple starts, settle in. I mean, it's probably for a lot of people the first time you're on that starting tee, you have your name announced, everything's very official, it's all roped off. You know, we like to give the events that professional feel. There's going to be some nerves there. So um, really just what I'm getting at, I just don't want people to take it as such an end-all be-all if you just have a bad first outing. And, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, you're hoping for better. You have high expectations. But don't let that be what determines the rest of your season, the rest of how you look at your junior golf outlook. I was about to say your whole junior career. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's just way too many starts, way too many opportunities to just let one bad start get you down. And so the last one that I found interesting, thought you would also appreciate, 2012 LPGA golfer, T55, T33, and 27th in their first three starts. What year was it again? 2012. 2012. Gosh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Other world number one, Nelly Cooper. Oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> so the two number ones Dang. in the world in their first start rattled off T40 and T55, respectively, <laughs> in their first two starts. Um, and I'd say it worked out pretty dang well for him so just wanted to throw that one out there 
all the people just getting started with the AJGA, any parents who are just getting involved, you know, don't don't need too much into those first couple starts. Obviously, some people come out and have phenomenal first couple starts. I mean, Miles Russell. When Miles jumped on the scene and he immediately, it seemed like, started winning everything. And so that's great for him. He's obviously doing very great things right now, but obviously that's not typical. Not everyone right. can do that. Right. And so you can only have so many winners out here. And so yeah, not like everyone's going to be in the winner circle. Not everyone's going to be holding up that trophy, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to get there or you can't have a great career. Um, I mean, if you look at Colin Morikawa, he never won an AJJ event. I think that's yeah. something that shocks people. Yeah. And again, I'd like to think people would consider that a very successful career for him. <laughs> but a guy who came out More was very highly won. ranked, but he never never held up that trophy. He was never the winner. So it doesn't have to be, but – that was just one of those things. I know it's a conversation I've had a lot of times, and it's just something that never quite sat right with me looking at it, thinking, like, I just don't want people to take it that seriously and let right. it ruin, like we said, a whole pathway. So interesting numbers. Again, thank you to AJJ historian uh, Adam Rogers for helping me out, doing a little deep dive here. Um, but that will I'll get off my high horse here, off my little pedestal <laughs> with my preachiness. But, Tim, what did you bring to the table here? <laughs> okay, well, I just think we need to – Hopefully, Patrick Kelly doesn't come for us. 92 99. I'd love to get him on the podcast to discuss because <laughs> you know he remembers 92- that shot. Before. Oh, yeah. 99. I bet he could walk you through all 99 of those shots. <laughs> Man. Okay. Well, mine is um, is interesting. You know, we just had the summer solstice, um, and there's certainly a number of golf courses, especially out west, that do summer solstice events, the longest day, all those things. Uh, but I was reading actually about a guy in Mississippi, and I'm going to read some of this information because I don't want to get some of this wrong. But he played 126 holes of golf in one day. He started at uh, 7 a.m., and he finished his seventh round at 8.40 p.m. So, I mean, technically, I think he could have gone I feel further, like he left but, some meat on the bone there. Well, I, th- like I was reading this article. Still got a little bit of daylight. <clears throat> I was reading the, uh, this article on, on Golf Week by Niles Kruger, and he was talking about how he, he came back after that seventh round. He finished, and he looked at the cart boys, and they looked more tired than he was, and so he decided <laughs> to just let them go home. But he, it was, it's crazy. Um, I think the most astonishing part about this was I'm gonna I'm gonna read his scores um, to you. He started. He's a, a three handicap. That's what he says. He started with a, a 73, a 76, 75, 76, 77, 74, 76. Over seven rounds of golf, he never strayed more than four strokes apart on on that spread, which I think is just <laughs> incredible. Also. During that entire process, they had a weather delay. He also jumped in the pool three times at the golf course, changed clothes like four times, took showers between rounds, um, all these different different things. So kind of an insane thing. The guy's name is um, – uh, let me see. His name is Matthew Rempe. So uh, insane. Oh, all this whole process was done in 90-degree weather too, 90-plus degree weather in, in Mississippi in the summertime. So Yeah, I'm more impressed insane. by the fact that, like you said, in that heat in Mississippi you can yeah. do that and, again, appreciate the pace of play. He was out there. I mean, he was moving. <laughs> he said he I played mean, his first, rounds. first 18 holes in an hour and uh, 40 minutes. Yeah, no, fire me up. That's exactly <laughs> – that's my kind of golf. Um, you get there. I don't need the practice swing. Get there. Yardage, boom. I mean, if you're playing 126 holes, by the time you're done, you're going to have that swing dialed. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you're ready to go. What's but, the most holes you've ever played in a day? I think it's just 36. Like, nothing too crazy. And even even at the end of 36, I mean, it was hot. We were down in Florida, um, in Orlando, just this past March, I want to say. Um, played 36 in a day. And, I mean, even by the end of that, I'm starting to struggle a little bit. Yeah. Like, um. I don't have that swing stamina. Like, I'm not dialed in like that. So good for this guy, obviously, with the three handicap. He's out playing quite a bit. But um, that's something that I think a lot of people may look at and think, oh, that sounds awesome, playing that much golf in a day. <laughs> I don't think most people want to play that much golf in a day. No, I don't. I don't think if I went out and attempted that, like, I wouldn't be able to move my arms for a week. I would probably put the clubs on the shelf and just not swing it for, like, a month. 14 hours of golf. Like, yeah, that's – love golf. That's a lot of golf. I think I played – 45 holes one time in high school there was this absolute goat ranch nine holes that you could play for like 10 bucks and you just play as many holes as you want me and my buddy went out literally at 6 a.m one in the summertime and just played 
50, uh, no, not 50, 45 holes. It was nine holes, so we played it five times. There you go. Those are the best. Just no tee times. <laughs> no, you just show up. None. You go. I, there was, there's basically no tee boxes either. <laughs> it's just kind of like a pasture with a, a tighter moan place where they put the hole. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was uh, it was crazy. It was in high school. It was exhausting then. I mean, I can't imagine now And as, a, as I'm older – dealing with that and playing i mean i think that i think he said he was like 36 years old or something so i respect that there is always you know i have again ideas guy tim so i've always had these different ajga ideas um for us but at one point there was a course in alaska that reached out to us um just kind of putting the feelers out there a little interested and i know how much sunlight they have out there exactly and so my thought was you know what let's go crazy 24 hours of tea times Sun doesn't set, and we just have we're just rotating staff through. We've got all these different waves going. Um, obviously, actually making that happen, horrendous <laughs> idea. But on paper, I'm looking at it and thinking that would be kind of cool. You, you could know? have like a 250 player field. Yeah, that's you're announcing somebody is starting <clears throat> at like the 2 a.m. tea time, and there's just no issue out there. So, one tea, imagine if you did just a one tea start and you just went, did, oh, you just keep it rolling. Oh my god, you just you're going continue. I'm here for it. I don't. Well, actually, I'm not. I don't want to be there. No, no part of me <laughs> wants to actually be involved in that. But on paper, again, I think it's a very cool idea. Yeah. yeah. Would never work. Would be absolutely miserable for everyone involved. But, again, ideas guy. The execution doesn't have to be there. Just yeah. throwing things at the wall here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Scotty Scheffler in your thing. Obviously, um, just it's kind of the the finish this this past weekend was interesting. The playoff with Tom Kim. And um, that that kind of friendship between him and Tom Kim, I think, is really interesting. Do you kind of miss some of the old, I don't say old, but not even that long ago, some of the golf rivalries that we've kind of had? I feel like golf has become much more, more nice over the last couple of years and much more, like, civil, I think. Um, like, Tom Kim and Scotty are, like, literally best friends, and they hang out, and they said great things about each other. They were joking. I think I saw Tom Kim say that they were joking walking down the fairway for that first playoff hole. But, like, do you miss a little bit of the edginess sometimes with some of the rivalries? And I mean, obviously, like, Tiger was just – I don't want to say he was mean, but he was dialed. How about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's cool to see. I mean, I think it was – for people who aren't maybe huge golf fans or maybe dialing in, they were – they were seeing that relationship and thinking, oh, this is very cool. These guys are good friends. And you always love to see the sportsmanship there. But like I said, there was just something about watching Tiger go out there and go nine and seven after Stephen Ames just comes out, makes some comments. And then Tiger's like, all right, I'm going to beat this guy into the ground and just didn't say a word to him, goes out and is just every shot is at the flag. And so stuff like that, cool to see. But I do appreciate, I think it's, it's very neat seeing those relationships with these guys on tour, how close they've gotten. And um, I know they're, it's a career they're competing, but at the end of the day, they're, they're seeing the same guys week in, week out. They're traveling together. Their families get to know each other. So um, super cool. I don't know if you saw the shot where Tom Kim afterwards goes over and um, is talking to Scotty's wife, meeting the new baby. And so definitely a cool shot there. And you know, it's those friendships are, going to go way beyond golf it's cool to see when you got have the guys going on vacation obviously jordan and justin ricky all those guys doing all that makes it feel a little more real um but i'm definitely with you some of those rivalries i think just gave a little bit of excitement to the sport where you're just watching and being like these guys are going at it it's more so like some of the like a football where it's a more of an aggressive sport you just kind of get that mentality and a little bit of a different view into the mindset there so i do miss it i appreciate it love tom kim love scotty um so happy for both of them, but there was just, like you said, something about Tiger just being dialed in, and you're like, nobody speak to this guy. He's <laughs> right. just You don't want to speak to that yeah. guy. <laughs> um, okay, the last thing I'll, I'll say about Scotty, uh, I think I saw this is, your, this is your fact of the podcast. Make sure you have that, Justin, fact of the podcast. Um, <laughs> Ted Scott, Scotty's caddy, mm. has won more money on tour this year than Jordan Spieth has. Yeah. Is no, that, I, I saw that graphic <laughs> the other like, day. Think, think about that for a second. Jordan Spieth in his earnings this year are less than Scotty's caddy. Yeah. This year. I mean, talk about finding the right bag to jump <laughs> on. I mean, they're a great pairing. I mean, if you follow either of them on social media, you know that they're very similar in how they conduct themselves and, and their lifestyles and things like that with um, 
it's just a great caddy player pairing, but yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Because, I mean, that's just – I mean, good for him. He's obviously doing a lot of work, putting in a lot of work on the front end there. But, I mean, just talk about the success that you could probably never ha- imagine having at that level. Like, if you're lucky, you're hoping to make a pretty solid career out of it, and this guy is set for life from one season yeah. on Scotty's back. Yeah. So – yeah. Good for him. But yeah, I did see that stat the other day and I was, thinking, I was like, holy cow. Like that is It's like two point six five million dollars or something that, that uh Ted has won. So yeah. Crazy. That's where I do love the caddies when you get a hot mic and you uh, you see the guys talking about like they're arguing with the player over what shot to hit, that yardage, everything, and the player's like, Screw it, I'm doing this. And you know deep inside that caddy's a little bit like, <laughs> I'm going to lose some money on this shot. <laughs> right. Like, if this shot goes wild, I'm, this is, me this on is the my line paycheck. Too. <laughs> <laughs> my life is on the line here, man. So, yeah. always fun yeah. to see. I mean, especially with Jordan, too. I mean, I feel like he's the example that always comes yeah. to mind with yeah. all those conversations because I love how vocal Jordan is when he's yeah. going through it's everything pre shot. And so, you know, they've always got the mics on him. Like, if there's one guy on the golf course, you get mic'd up, it's Jordan Spieth. Because yeah. you're like, he's going to try something crazy, and it's going to be awesome. Yeah, but, 100%. No, I love those little conversations with the caddies. It's always definitely interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, speaking about, you know, kind of good guys and, and some of the impact, uh, Jordan Spieth actually has his event this week um, um, for the AJGA and giving back. And uh, a lot of our juniors give back, too, through a program we have called Leadership Links. Um, and our guest that we are going to have join us here in a minute, um, Liam, he is part of that program and has a really cool story. Um, leadership links basically is something that AJJ does to help, uh, our juniors raise money. We empower them to raise money for a charity they care about as well as our Liberty national ACE grant. Um, but Liam has a really awesome story. And so I want to go ahead and welcome Liam to the podcast. Hope you're doing well today. Thanks for joining us. How are you guys? We're good. We're good. Just enjoying some nice sunny weather. I know you uh, didn't have that yesterday. Where, tell us about where you're playing right now. So I'm playing at McCray in Barrington, Illinois. It's a little windy, rainy yesterday, so tea times got delayed about four hours. It's not the most fun thing waking up at 5 a.m. for a tea time that's at 7.30, but then you really play at like 1 o'clock, so that's not too much fun. Yeah. No, we had some similar issues going on in Ohio as well. I think we were also delayed exactly four hours, so good to see just across the board everyone is having a great golf day. <laughs> Today's a better day, though. I think you said it was it was sunny in 90, so... Yeah, no win today either. So that's nice. Awesome. Well, I think uh, we can just, I really want to just start out by having you kind of tell us, um, I think Thomas and I know kind of the story of how you got started with the fundraising, just a little background. You fundraise through Leadership Links, a program that AJGA has to help juniors raise money and impact uh, their community. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you kind of got started with that process, going all the way back to the tournament that you're playing in and kind of some of the, the um, kind of health issues that you started having there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So last year in July, I was playing at an AJGA in somewhere Robinson, Illinois, and I had I was feeling great that week, and then somehow a couple of days before, I got kind of got sick, got a big stomach ache, and then got to the tournament. Was playing in the Junior M, which Junior M's are really awesome to meet new people and stuff. And I really got sick that day, and I didn't really feel like myself. I mean, I love playing golf, and I just didn't really want to play golf that day. I had yeah, like I said, really bad stomach ache, and I mean. Then the next day I woke up ready for the tournament and had a really bad heart problems and had to, and then we went to the hospital and like, I found out that I had myocarditis, which is a really weird, really weird fluke thing. And I had to be airlifted to Chicago, which was really scary experience for me, but an awesome experience because getting helicoptered is, I mean, it's not the cool, it's cool. (laughs) This is every teenage boy's dream. (laughs) I know. Like being in a helicopter was really awesome, but like not for the reason I was in it, but it was, it was still pretty cool. cool. But the one thing I want to take, like go back is I wanted to see the Chicago skyline, but I was so tired. I fell asleep in the helicopter and I was like, I wanted them to take me back around one more time to see the skyline and stuff. But <laughs> Hey, checking one off the bucket list is checking one off the bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And then, um, yeah, things got, I had troponin levels, which is, I don't, I don't even know what troponin levels are, but they. They're like something they they tell like they rate like a heart attack and stuff. They said my troponin levels were double the rate of a heart attack, which of like a really serious heart attack. So that was pretty crazy, and they were really getting all scary. But I remember one time my mom left the room to go talk to the nurse, and she came back and she was she saw a bunch of kids and stuff, and I she brought, came back to me and told me that, and 
ever since that, I really wanted to help people. And by doing the Jack Nicholas Healthcare Foundation and really raising money, I really got inspired to do that. So you, let me, let me see. There's a lot to unpack here. So you basically, you're playing an AJJ tournament and you had what amounts to a massive heart attack. Is that kind of basically? Yeah. (laughs) So you had a heart attack at an AJJ tournament. Then you go to the hospital, they airlift you. And then, so you were in the hospital though for a while, right? And you couldn't really do anything. Yeah. Seven days, seven, yeah, seven days. And so what, during that seven days, what's going through your mind? You know, you're one day you're playing golf and the next, it seems like your life has kind of changed forever. Just kind of, when am I going to play golf again? That was definitely like the first thought. Cause I mean, golf's like my life. I love golf and I do it every day. And I just really like, that was definitely the first thought is when am I going to get to play golf again? How long is it going to be? I mean, is it going to be a lifelong thing that I'm going to have this heart problem or, and that's pretty much it. Did you, um, or I guess w- at what point did you start thinking, wow, I, I could really do something in my time here. I can't play golf. Like I need to, I want to be doing something in my time since I have to kind of lay low and talk about that. Definitely after I got home for a couple of days and they really said I couldn't do any movement for like three to six months. And I was like, I can't just sit here. I mean, sitting on a couch for six months isn't really fun. It gets boring. And and I, first thing I thought, I, I saw some of the Ace Grant last year when I was playing in tournaments. They always have um, the Roseanne quote and how it like really helps people. And I was like, all right, that maybe that's something I want to do. And then I looked more into it and I talked to my parents about it and they were on board with it. And I was like, yeah, this is something I want to do. And so tell us a little bit about what that process of actually getting the fundraising started looked like for you. You know, you you see a little bit of this information, but then you've actually got to kind of dive in at some point here. Yeah, I mean, I just had to, I mean, even from my parents' help, I really kind of just had to dive into it, see what how much I wanted to raise and how it all works. And it really just, it was really an awesome process. Did you, how did you go about raising that money uh, specifically? Because I think at the end of the day, you raised over $30,000 last year, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did that, what did you do to raise that money um, kind of throughout that process? I reached out to a bunch of fundraisers, a bunch of people that I knew, and I'd really just kind of like, I didn't like hammer. I wouldn't say I hammered them, but I was really, I really made a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails I sent, and I was just really trying to reach out to people, trying to really see how much I could raise to help all these people. It's very cool. And you go through that process. And so I'm sure at some point you talk about golf was your life. You wanted to get back at what point throughout this process did you start turning back to, you know, like I've got to get out there and tell us a little bit about that process. Um, I, after one of my doctor's appointments, my doctor was really awesome. She said that her husband actually convinced her to let me play golf again. She said that like her husband was an avid golfer and he said if she didn't let me putt that she's a crazy doctor and that she's just a bad doctor and that was really awesome so then she opened me up to putting and chipping which was really cool and then then I really just grinded putting and chipping and then I was like and then a couple weeks later she finally opened me up to everything and it was just amazing yeah you um I guess the notes that I have here say you came back and you did you win a high school tournament like right after that or I got right after that i yeah I did win a high school event and then I got second in state, which is really cool for being out for four months and then finally getting back to it just with a month to prepare and then kind of got yeah, second in state so you went from having a massive heart attack mm-hmm. getting airlifted bucket list item to uh <laughs> to being not doing anything for four months to winning a high school tournament and finishing second at state in six months. Right. That's what we're talking about here. That's Mm -hmm. crazy. (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's a timeline. Like if you were to make a movie, that's something you're trying to condense. Like you're just making this seem so casual as if this is, Oh yeah. I mean, everyone goes through that. Right. As if you didn't have this life altering event happen to just bounce back and act like nothing happened. I mean, what's, I mean, so much of that has to be mindset. By the way, he raised $30,000 during that process. Yeah, just (laughs) casually in the middle of the airflow, $30,000 to charity. So um, how did you handle the mental aspect of that? Where obviously that's got to be very tough and very draining on you going through this process. Mm -hmm. I definitely use a lot of my faith in the process because, I mean, like I didn't know it was going to happen. I had no clue that I I didn't even know like anything what like anything was going to happen at that point so i was like i just have to be faithful and i had some of my bible verses and i really just prayed that i was going to be okay and everything worked out in the end really good what does it mean to you to be able to impact 
people or, or kids who have kind of gone through a similar situation with the Nicholas Children's Health Care Foundation and raising part of that money that you raised for them. How does that make you feel or, or what does that kind of, how does that motivate you? It makes me definitely feel amazing. I mean, like, like just reading some of the stories for the Nicholas Healthcare Foundation. I mean, like, I'm pretty blessed with my parents and stuff. My parents work really hard and I'm blessed that they were able to, and I had great doctors around me to take care of me, but being able to help people who are definitely in need, it just kind of makes me realize more like the golf aspect too, that not like, even if when I had a bad golf shot, it's just one bad shot. I mean, there's people with bigger problems out there and bigger things to deal with and then they are not able to golf and I'm able to go out there. And if I get mad over one golf shot, does it like at the end of the day, I mean, it matters, but does it really matter that much when there's people out there dealing with way bigger issues than I have? And so with that, you're continuing those fundraising efforts. Part of your efforts last year resulted in you actually getting to meet Jack Nicholas. So what did that mean to you getting to meet a golf legend, but also somebody who you are now making an impact with side by side there? That was unreal experience, just going to see his house and to meet it, meet all of his people and meet his wife was um, unbelievable. They're such a nice family. And they, I mean, his wife even made his cookies, which was really cool. They were, and like has had a cake for us. It was really awesome. He was just so cool. All the stories he told and how the impact and like how much family means to him and how much people mean to him is just really cool. But yeah, I mean, it was amazing. Um, so you raised obviously $30,000 last year. What's your goal for this year fundraising wise and kind of what are you doing to reach that goal? $77,000 this year is definitely the goal. I mean, it's a huge goal, really big. It's almost double what I had. Yeah, it is double that I had last year, but I mean, so this year I'm still going to reach out to a bunch of fundraisers, a bunch of people, but at my member guest this year at my club, I'm going to do like a fundraising event where like people can like donate money and we can, it's like a, we'll have games and stuff like that where you can try to like the pro my club, you can beat the pro closest to the pin, something like that if you beat it. And, but yeah, just, and then I have got a signed photo or of Jack Nicholas last year and I'm going to also give that away to the highest fundraiser. Very cool. And so you mentioned doing a lot of that stuff with your club. I mean, what does that mean to you that all these people have kind of rallied around you and are willing to help support your efforts here? It definitely means a lot. I mean, not just to me, but just all the people out there who are in need. I mean, it just means so much that people like want to give to give back, and it just it's just so cool to see. If you could take one thing away from this whole experience that you've had, um, what do you think that one thing, one takeaway would be? Well, um, like I said, that like I mean, going just having faith for sure, just having more faith, and like just like realizing that. Like I said earlier, like have in life, like it, when I had a bad golf shot, it doesn't really matter. And just like giving back more to people too, like this is so cool to, to be able to do that through this experiment experience. Oh, very cool. And with, I mean, it's obviously an inspiring story for a lot of people and hopefully everyone out there listening to this kind of can take something away. But um, for some of those people who are maybe thinking about trying to do something similar and get involved with leadership links, what advice would you give them? Where should they start? Mm -hmm. definitely just be patient. I mean, I mean, it doesn't just like, you don't just raise all the money at once. You got to definitely be patient. And I mean, some people are going to say no, and you just got to kind of deal with that and then just kind of move on to the next and just figure it out. And like, hopefully that you just get people to say yes. But I mean, yeah, that's pretty much what I would say. So you just talked, you basically, you're just cold calling people and asking them for money. Is, is that basically how you raised all that money last sure. year? I cold, I would cold call people and kind of just give them my story and just kind of tell them that I'm trying to help out people in need. And yeah, and I would just email a bunch of people and just hope that people would say yes. And I mean, yeah, obviously there are people who would say no, but it was just a really cool experience. I mean, perfectly honest, if, if he cold called me and said, hey, this, I had, a, I had this heart thing happen at the tournament, and I'd have been like, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah, I got to give you something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a story, like you said, it's unbelievable, just that timeline of how quickly things can change kind of shows you, you know, never take anything for granted, but um, I do certainly enjoy the aspect of it that you've taken so many positives out of it, because I can't imagine too many people would look back on that story, and for them... They're like, this was awesome. I got to ride in a helicopter. Um, so I think a lot of that positivity really shows through with what you're doing. But um, certainly something, like we said, hopefully everyone can take away because incredible story, something that truly inspiring. Um, I know it's a little different than maybe some of the things we've talked about so far on the podcast, but certainly 
important. Just just speaks to how many of those stories are out there and kind of that goal of why we why we got into this. So yeah, um, we really appreciate you sharing that story with us. It's I said it's inspiring. I don't I can't even imagine going through something like that and then bouncing back and doing as many things as you've done here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what are your goals for kind of the rest of, obviously we talked about your fundraising goal for this year. What are your goals golf wise, um, schooling wise, that sort of thing over the next year? And cause you're a, you're a junior, is that correct? Yeah, I'm going into junior year. Yep. Going into junior year. So what are your kind of goals for golf and beyond? Goals definitely to be pro, definitely to have the chance to go pro definitely over to see where I'm going to school after this year, seeing what my options are and definitely just because I want to go somewhere where I have a great group of guys and can really get a good culture and then practice for four years to, like I said, go pro. And then um, this year, probably to win an AJGA. I got a couple left. I got, um, uh, I forgot what they're called. I got a Bass Pro Shops one. I got a couple of Missouri and then Stan Utley, which is awesome. I want to win one of those, which I believe I can. So yeah, definitely that. Very cool. Both super fun events. I've been to both of them. Love Bass Pro. That's just beautiful. Talk about a place you'd want to tour in a helicopter, maybe just under some different circumstances this time. <laughs> maybe we can, maybe you can set that up. But um, no, certainly a fun one. Hopefully you get a chance to enjoy everything that one has to offer out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, just a couple of other, you know, kind of questions before we kind of wrap up. How did you get into golf originally? Uh, my parents always yeah i feel like that's a big one for everyone their parents kind of got them into it but my parents always used to bring me out i would play here and there i always had an ipad and then when i wanted to play i would just play but i remember one time i just i played nine holes didn't even realize i didn't even go on my ipad and then from there i just loved it and i then after that i think i shot i made my first chip in and i was like oh yeah this sport's awesome this sport's easy and i want to keep playing it but i found out (laughs) the sport's not very easy it's kind of (laughs) hard and then i just still just loved it from there so you were an iPad kid and golf saved you from the, from the iPad kid life. Nice. Yep, exactly. <laughs> that's huge. That's big. Congratulations <laughs> on that one. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay. A couple other, you know, random questions. Um, it wouldn't be the podcast if we didn't talk about food, Thomas. So what's your favorite type of food? What do you, what are you eating these days? Ooh, a bunch of Chipotle and sushi. Weird, weird, weird couple. Like Chipotle and sushi are very different. But yeah, Chipotle and sushi are definitely my main go-tos. That seems like a weird combo, but I don't think too many people would fight you on that. Like, I feel like a lot of people here, I, like your comms department comes to mind, Tim. It <laughs> seems like a very sushi and Chipotle heavy group. Eclectic, eclectic group, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you know you and uh, you and Thomas are fellow Illinois, Illinoisans? Illin- Nailed it. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so what's your favorite part about the Midwest? I know Thomas is always big on the Midwest. What's your favorite part? Definitely the food. I mean, the food is pretty unmatched. I mean, the pizza in Chicago and the hot dogs are just unmatched. I mean, the sports, I mean, we're not the best teams by any means, but I mean, they're still fun to go to games and it's still fun to just watch. Yeah. No, this West Coast stretch with the Cubs is killing me because I know the bullpen's going to blow it. And so I've just been... Staying up late at night, watching blow it. It's been great for the mental health here. So, <laughs> staying up late just to lose. <laughs> yeah, I know you're uh, you're a little bit more towards the north side. Are you a Cubs or a White Sox fan up there? Oh, definitely a Cubs fan. No way, I'm a White Sox fan. There we go. That <laughs> well, was the correct answer. You've had so- some recent success, not too long ago. We want it now, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, Liam, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you. I just really want to say thank you for all you do raising money. I think that's a huge thing. Um, I think it's awesome that at your age that you're really trying to do that and put that together and you know, taking such what could have been a, such a negative circumstance and really turning it into something positive and really awesome story. So thank you so much for sharing that um, with us. And we certainly wish you the best at the tournament you're at and obviously at the AJGA events kind of down the road as well. So really appreciate you sharing with us and thanks for all you're doing. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate everything, Liam. Best of luck out there. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Liam. Wow. That was uh, just a wild story, Thomas. I don't know. Like, I mean, he's, what, 16 years old, and he's dealing with, you know, 15 years old, maybe even dealing with that heart condition stuff. And, I mean, 
and his first thought is, I need to give back to these people because they've been so great to me and, and help other kids who are going through this. I mean, that's just crazy. So <laughs> kudos to Liam for everything that he's doing. And you know, obviously it's a great story and, and one that we're more than happy to tell and excited to kind of share with everybody. Yeah, no, I think it speaks so much to Liam as a person that he can be going through such a tough time. And it would be very easy for anyone to just look at it so negatively and just yeah. be down on your luck. But the fact that he stayed so positive and – I mean, my favorite part about the whole story is how much he just loved the helicopter. Ride. <laughs> He's like, I just had a severe heart attack. Can we take another lap? Like, <laughs> right. give me. I want to see the skyline. Yeah, give me another chance. Can we wait till sunset? Maybe give me a little <laughs> bit of action here. But no, very, very cool story. Very fortunate to have him on. Like I said, a little bit different than maybe some other stuff we've talked about on the podcast thus far. But um, that's what we're here for, to share some of these great stories. And um, thankfully, we, with all of our history, have the opportunity to share some of the stories of our own. So um Perfect chance for our executive director, Stephen Hamblin, to come back on and share an interesting story he actually has about someone you may have heard of, Phil Mickelson. So, Stephen, take it away. Thanks, Tom and Tim, for having me on again. I, I appreciate it very much. Uh, reliving some of these stories about past players is really fun, so thank you. Uh, neat story about Phil Mickelson. He was a player rep on our board and I remember in Dallas uh, one year with, at a board meeting, uh, we had an opportunity to play at Los Colinas. It was the first time Phil had ever played, and it was Joe Quirk and Phil against uh, myself and Trip Keeney. Uh, Phil had shot a couple under on the front, and then birdied 10, and Trip said, come on, let's get to our carts real fast. We got to get to 11T first. So we jump in our carts, roar down to 11T. He said, pull your driver out, pull your driver out. So we both pull our drivers out. And it wasn't a driver hole. It was a little tiny dog leg around a, la a lake. Uh, it was probably like a four iron, nine iron kind of hole. And Phil pulls up, again, first time he's ever seen the golf course. Uh, looks at us with driver, looks at the hole, looks at us with driver, pulls his driver. And Tripp gives me the elbow like, um, this is going to be interesting. So Joe Quirk hits first, one of our board members, and he kind of toe skies it. And where that ball lands, it was perfect with his driver. And Phil looked at us, uh, us again, teed up his driver, and flew it onto the green. And I looked at Tripp and I said, well, Tripp, that's so much for gamesmanship for you. Thanks again to Stephen Hamlin for coming on. Like we talked about, a lot of those great stories that really nobody else but Stephen is going to have, just having been here through the history of the AJGA. So um, funny to hear. I mean, anytime you hear something like that, it truly gives you kind of a picture of like how good these juniors are. I think that's something for me that when we're – we're out there and the volunteers are talking about like it's just so fun to watch like it truly is i mean these kids are so much better than we could ever hope to be at this point so um, at any point in my life yeah at any point because they are incredible but thanks again to steven um it was great hearing from him but we want to go ahead and move into if you follow us on social media you'll see that um, we've been reaching out trying to get some of your questions want to hear from you guys listeners of the podcast um and any questions you have about the AJGA, the game of golf in general, and see if we can give you a little bit of input. But, Tim, I'm going to throw our first one at you here from Jaden. How do I get out of a golf funk? I've been stuck shooting mid-80s with hours of practice. Well, Jaden, welcome to my life. <laughs> but just put 90s there, not 80s. Um, you know, obviously we're not golf experts by any means. We, we like to play and we're around it a lot. But, you know, I think it probably – Taking a break from golf when you're in kind of like a funk like that is never a bad idea. I think it's always a good idea to take a break, you know, relax, mentally bre take a, me a break, physically take a break, um, do some other stuff, you know, take a vacation or just do something, just change it up in some way. I think, you know, whether it's your practice routine or something like that, I would just try to change whatever you're doing. Again, where I'm not an expert, but that's what I would do if, you know, I was kind of trying to change it up a little bit, I yeah. think. No, absolutely. Like I said, just take a break, get back to the basics, nothing. I mean, um, knew I grew up playing baseball quite a bit and it was kind of the same way in baseball. It was like, something's off with a swing. You just go back to hitting off a tee. It seems like something minor seems like, oh, I'm not hitting off a tee. I'm 18, 20 years old. No, you're Get back to the basics. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but our next question, Tim, comes from Maria. 
Hi, how can I practice at home? Right now, my family doesn't have the money to pay for it. I love this question because I think it gives me a chance to talk about two things. One, this is kind of a funny story, but growing up, I didn't have a lot. I actually found my my very first golf club I pulled out of a trash pile on the side of the road. It was a putter, and it was, I don't know what it was made of, some sort of metal. But I played with that for like a really long time. That kind of sparked the uh, golf bug in my life. I actually dug a hole in my backyard, and there was a, like a, I found a, discard piece of PVC pipe that I buried in the ground and and I would putt to it and one day I actually broke that putter because I was trying to use it like a wedge and hit it over the house but um, I think really there's there's a lot of ways you can do it you can certainly do um, just chipping around your yard or putting in your house I mean what what better way to read read a surface than trying to putt across a floor or something along those lines? Um, but it also gives you a chance to talk about our uh, Liberty National Ace Grant, which is a financial assistance program that we have for junior golfers who have that physical ability, who have that skill set to play a national junior golf schedule, but they don't have the financial means to. And there's a process that we go through, but you can get more information on that on our website. But Maria, I would say really just just find ways to get creative. You know, set up putt putt courses around your house. You know. That's just like um, fun ways to do it, that, and that doesn't cost anything, and that's really easy to do. Or, you know, chip around your yard or even, you know, find if you can find a, a bed sheet that you're able to hit into in the garage or something like that, I think are all, you know, great ways that you can kind of practice on, and when you're on a budget. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, like you said, getting creative with it. There's always little things you can do at home. I know um, a few years ago with um, obviously a lot of things being shut down and people had to get creative with practice. I saw a lot of videos of people – at home in the living room, just little things like that. So, um, can always get creative. Um, I do love that story. I know you've mentioned it before, how you sunk the PVC pipe in the yard and got practicing that way. So funny um, fact, my, my cousin actually broke her toe cause she stepped in it one time, but <laughs> <laughs> side point, <laughs> Thomas, I got one for you. Um, let's see what, uh, this is from Zuri. What's your favorite club in the bag? Favorite club in the bag right now, undoubtedly the QI 10. I know if you're a follower of the podcast, I mentioned it a few times before, but the best driver that Taylor made has ever made hands down. And you know how much I love my R seven, the R seven. It pained me to give that thing up um, when the stealth came around, but the QI 10, it doesn't miss. Like I hit that thing anywhere on the face and it is just so pure fairway finder, which huge part of my game that used to be the issue is I just could not sniff a fairway or keep a drive Wait, on the planet. You swing too hard. What? We don't need to get into the <laughs> basics here or into, into my swing mechanics, Tim, but, uh, Either way, with QI10 dialed, so easily the driver. I love that thing. But what about you? What do you got in the bag? Uh, I recently got some some high toe wedges um, that I absolutely love. Uh, they've got the black finish on them, which I think just they look so good. But that sixty degree, I'm I'm not a very good player. I have you know some some issues with my swing, but I can back those things up, um, no issues at all. So I think that kind of tells you how good they are. So okay. I would just say my my wedges. All right. Another one, Tim, this one's coming to us from Ethan. Is it too late to start the AJGA? That's actually a really good question. I think it's probably something that people um, kind of assume uh, in a lot of ways. But there's actually, you know, the way that we prioritize entry into our tournaments, you know, if you if you haven't signed or you're kind of a little later in your in your career, you can you can still get started with us. You know, our preview events are, de- are de- specifically designed for players who have never played with us before, no matter what your grad year is or you know, no matter what your year in school is. So preview events are certainly a way to go. We have a lot of qualifiers that are a really great opportunity, and those are going to be – so just finding an event close to you and, and applying for the qualifier to get into a tournament or just to gain experience on the national stage, I think – that's really great. And Thomas, you mentioned this earlier, but the the senior events that we have, you know, in December, we have three senior only events that are specifically designed to help kids who are later in their in their um, junior careers and maybe haven't signed a college golf scholarship yet or haven't signed to play with a school. And there's, you know, hundreds of coaches at these three events done in conjunction with the coaches convention. Um, that's a great way to kind of get exposed as well. But all of those ways are, are things that you can do to kind of start, even if you haven't, you know, begun at, you know, 14, 15 years old, even later in your career you can do take advantage of all of those events um and the opportunities that they would provide to get into to tournaments with the AJJ. yeah no seniors always a fun one like you mentioned just with the coaches convention so many cool stories we're bun- bussing coaches over and those are coaches looking to fill a roster spot yeah. they're people who they know this is going to be a high level of golf they have open spots they're they're trying to fill those rosters so certainly um, if you're at that point in the AJJ career you're unsigned cannot recommend those senior events enough um 
great time out there. And like I said, so many kids walk away with scholarships from that week and just very cool stories. We have some of our college golf advisors who are out there that can kind of help you on that, navigate that um, roadmap that is college recruiting as well. So um, certainly, certainly a cool event would highly recommend that to anybody. Yeah. All right. Last question. I'm going to, I'm going to let you answer this one. This question, Thomas, is from Connor Sullivan, who is our friend at TaylorMade. And he has, his, this is his, uh, it's more of a statement. Can I beat any junior golfer in a foot race? And why is the answer? Yes. So I'm going to put my mic down, Thomas, and just kind of let you cook here. Yeah. So uh, let me get one thing straight. This question stems from the argument that we have had since episode one, people wondering, are golfers athletes? I think there are some golfers that are athletes. Connor Sullivan is not one of them. Love the guy to death. Uh, he's on a hot streak right now in golf, and a, within a week span, he had his second career hole in one, and then he holed out from like 97 yards in the fairway um, at Rolex Girls when he was playing the Junior Am. So, on a hot streak, good golfer. He is getting cooked in a foot race by 95% of our juniors. I, I think the first argument started at Carlton Woods, where he and Blades Brown got into it a little bit, um, arguing about this. Um, so if you look at Blades, I mean, Blades seems like an athlete. His mom played in WNBA. He's obviously a very high-level golfer. Just looks like an athlete. Connor thinks he could line it up in the parking lot and go get him. No chance. I just – if you've ever seen Connor do anything remotely athletic, you understand where I'm coming from with this. I so. saw him on social media riding his bike in, in Carlsbad, and it was an e-bike. So there you go. He's on his e-bike. He's got the dog strapped to his back. He's He's not the most athletic guy. Love him to death. Great guy. No, no chance. Like, you're telling me he lines it up with Wheaton Ennis and is not getting smoked. I mean, Wheaton looks like he should be playing fullback somewhere. But Yeah, I'm taking Wheaton any day. <laughs> yeah, so it's something we can easily test. Um, he brings this up. I can make that happen. Come to an event. Junior players this year. I'll line you up with any of the juniors. We'll run you down the range, and he's getting smoked. So I think we're doing a pod from junior players this year, so this seems like something we should make happen. Yeah, stay tuned. Um Certainly watch on YouTube. This will be some great content for us because you're going to want to see him get blown out of the water, and then there's going to be some excuse. You're At some point, he's going to pop a hammy, tweak an ankle, something's going on, wind was blowing, dog was barking. But either way, Connor Sullivan, the answer is no. He cannot beat 95% of our juniors in foot race. Just to be clear, Connor brought this on himself. So Yeah, no, he, he asked for this. He wanted this to be addressed on the podcast. We gave him what he was asking for. There you go. There you go. Well, um, that's all the questions that we had, but certainly some fun ones there and also some good ones. We're going to try to answer some more of those uh, through our player services department. They have a little bit more specific information when it comes to a few of the other questions we got about playing in AJJ events and um, that sort of thing. But uh, make sure you're following us on social media at AJJ Golf. That's going to be on X. That's going to be Instagram, TikTok. Facebook, LinkedIn, all of the channels. So follow us there and just DM us if you have any additional questions. And I'm sure we'll be putting out some more social posts about um, asking for those. But um, that's all we got. You know, I appreciate everybody listening here to the bitter end of this episode. Uh, so, Thomas, thanks for your time today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, see you next time, guys.